This week's On Story, writer Edward Neumeyer discusses his sci-fi classics RoboCop and Starship Troopers. We want to be protected. We think, what is the cost of being uh, a soldier? What is the cost of being uh, a cop? And what are the benefits to society? And we can't live without them. And so I think there's a fascination with that whole thing. This week on On Story, writer Edward Neumeyer discusses his process behind the sci-fi cult classics RoboCop and Starship Troopers. Neumeyer explores the particulars of writing for the genre, as well as his talent for disguising deep issues with expansive and captivating stories. I really want to um, focus on just the great storytelling and the classicness of the the things you've written and, and how they... Um, still continue to be relevant. So I guess first question is, you you didn't start out, maybe you wanted to be a writer, but you didn't start your career as a writer, right? Uh, no, I, I well, I always kind of wanted to be a writer. And the first job I looked for was as a story analyst. And story analysts, readers, uh, there used to be a union for them, read for producers and studios and stuff like that. And so I think I read 5,000 screenplays. And uh, uh, most of them were, were not very good. And I, to this day, I don't know if I could have short-circuited that by only reading good screenplays. But I have a feeling that the bad screenplays made you think you could do it at a certain point. And so I was briefly an executive at Universal Pictures for about a year and two years. That was like a graduate, little graduate course in development. And you got to read lots of things and you started to get into what would get made and what would not get made. And you understood a little bit what the buying mentality was. I started working on the idea that became RoboCop in like 1981 and uh, 80, 81. And it was four years before there was a draft. And the first draft was written while I was still an executive, or I, uh, I, I did a terrible thing. I, I, I had to go write the first act and I told them that my grandfather had died. He was already dead. Uh, and, and, and I went away for a, a week to the funeral and they sent me flowers. And, <laughs> But that's how, you know, that's what you have to do to, uh, to, 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 if you, you have to want it so badly that you lie to your boss and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, by then I had met my partner, Mike Miner, who met me when I was an executive. And we started working together and we've, you know, on nights and weekends and finished the script. And I had, I'd heard stories about John Davis and he had produced Airplane and he was a bigger than life character. When I finally got to him, I got, I, I, I had in mind that he was a guy that could help us. And, uh, I got it to a director named Jonathan Kaplan, who was a friend of a friend, and he read it and said, well, this would be perfect for John Davison. And I was like, uh. And then John Davison read it, and he said, I don't know why to this day. He said, yeah, let's do it. And he was the perfect guy. I, I have to tell you, luck plays such a big deal in, in what has happened to me, because there was nobody better on the horizon that I look back on 35 years later who could have done such a good job as, as this guy did. I think the really amazing thing about it is, it, watching it again the other night, um, it was like, it just holds up. You're ma writing this script in an era, a political era, a social era, um, in a lot of ways not too different from now, even though it was 40 years ago, whatever. Um, you were <laughs> So you're crafting some of that response to the world at the time into your storytelling. You know, did sci-fi make that an easier process to do? Or was it really just some, the story you wanted to tell and the social commentary you were building in? Science fiction was not supposed to be the first thing you wrote because it was expensive and people didn't know what to do with it. And so it was really against the advice of people that RoboCop was a science fiction story. But it was always meant to be pretty cheap. I was very interested in action films. I loved Dirty Harry. I loved those movies. I loved Wild Bunch. I was absolutely, the first thing I did when I was 15 was I learned how to make bullet squibs so you could shoot somebody. Uh, that was just a hobby of mine. You know, I was, I was a, sort of obsessed with screen violence. Uh, and that worked out for me later. <laughs> um, and, um, but I grew up in a place in, in Northern California, Marin County, which is very liberal in its political thinking. And in fact, uh, they didn't like action movies up there. And that was like you were a fascist if you liked action movies. So I sort of had this challenge from youth of like, I'm going to write an action movie that is like for, you know, everybody, but I'm going to put other stuff in it. I'm going to put a, so, a level of satire in it to sort of, I don't know why I'd want to do that, but that, the, the media breaks in RoboCop were really that thing, were, were really part of that. And I also wanted it to be funny. 
And the, the most interesting journey for me with that script was no one, everyone would say, well, why is this funny? This shouldn't be funny. Even for a little while, my writing partner, Mike Miner, was like, yeah, but should this be funny? You know, and I was like, no, it should be funny. Uh, then I met John Davison, who had done Airplane, and who was a very sophisticated maker of movies. And he said, no, it can be funny, because funny is entertainment. After many people turned us down, Paul Verhoeven, for, for reasons that I now know very well, said yes. And it was, it just changed everything. He was sort of down on his luck, because his last movie hadn't done that well, and he needed something. Actually, everybody who made this movie needed something. And that's another thing to remember. John Davison had had a, a movie that hadn't worked. Uh, Top Secret, I think he made. And uh, every, uh, Phil Tippett had had a movie that hadn't worked very well, Howard the Duck. You know, so all, all, of these, all of us came together desperate to achieve something. But again, Verhoeven, who I, I still work with, he is really a genius. And he really is. And that's why the movie holds, holds up so well. And then he enters the picture. And English is actually not his first language. And he's reading this satirical script. And this guy has a PhD in math. <laughs> I mean, he was, he has a classical European education. He spoke five languages. But I mean, but the, but the fact is you've written a satire and that is you very... You know, he, when he first read it, he said, why is this funny? And I was like, oh, because if it's not funny, they'll be laughing at us, you know? <laughs> and he didn't really get that. He was like, if I make it, it's not going to be funny. It's mm -hmm. going to be serious. And he left. He went back to Holland and, and he asked us to rewrite the script without any jokes in it. And so we did it. And it was kind of miserable. We couldn't even finish it. My partner broke his leg, so he couldn't even show up at the end. So Paul shows up, and I'm there. I've literally slept in the office that night trying to finish it. I didn't make it. And he sits down, and he reads it in front of me, which is terrible. <laughs> and, um, and then he comes to the end, and he goes, he, he, he did something that no American director that I know of has ever done in his life. He said, I was wrong. We're going to go back to your script. I understand it now. I had given him some comic books to take back to Holland with him as a last desperate measure. And he, uh, he read them. And then he said, oh, uh, this reminded me of my childhood. And I like, love comic books. The violence part. I'd seen that movie so many times, but I kind of forgot about it. And when I watched it again recently, it was like, oh, man, I forgot about that scene. I don't know why, but and it was the arm, you know? I mean, oh, the arm, the arm. Oh. Yeah, that's the scene that got us Paul Verhoeven. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> but, you know, when I went back and looked at it after the first, like, uh, you know, hiccup, then I went back and I looked at it and like, okay, it's so cartoonish. It is comic booky. It doesn't really feel like, because of the way it was shot, it looks, it was set up a certain way. So I guess maybe that's why I didn't really remember it as an ultimately violent movie. I remember Scarface is a much more violent movie than this. And maybe because there is humor in your film. Yeah, you know? Scarface is actually, strangely, the scene you're thinking of is the shower, is the yeah, chainsaw yeah, yeah. scene. Chainsaw there is scene. no, there is no cut in that. You, you never see contact. It's yeah. all, it's all done. When I met, when Paul and I sat down, I think one of the reasons we started getting along is, is we had a very early conversation conversation where uh, we both agreed that we, we actually liked violence on screen. Not real violence, but vi screen violence. And he shoots a very balletic, it's really beautiful what he does. It's violence, but it's really beautiful, and I like it. That was one of the things that I, I really wanted to see was that in an action movie, uh, that it was not uh, uh, sterile. The, the other thing that was important to me was I knew that when you did something like that, you caused a great deal of tension in the viewer. And so my theory was that with all that tension, if you told them a joke, they'd laugh really loud. If you look at the movie, you'll see it's, it's action set piece followed by humor as much as possible. Top story, Pretoria. The threat of nuclear confrontation in South Africa escalated today when the ruling white military government of that besieged city-state unveiled a French-made neutron bomb and affirmed its willingness to use the three megaton device as the city's last line of defense. And the president's first press conference from the Star Wars orbiting peace platform got off to a shaky start when power failed, causing a brief but harmless period of weightlessness for the visiting president and his staff. We'll be back in a moment. So that brings me to the characters in your story here. The bad guys are definitely just bad, you know? They really have no positive aspects to them. When you're setting up characters like that, did you, you know, was that really more of the time or did you feel like, you know, this is just your statement? I think the statement was really that, that for a policeman, for a cop, our cop, he faced enemies at the top of society at the bottom. And my then idea was that there wasn't that much difference between them. 
you know, that idea that the criminals were essentially the as same as the people, some of the people in the boardrooms. And uh, the Clarence Boddicker character is one of my favorite, mm -hmm. and I don't know quite where he came from. He seems to, I think he's sort of patterned, he's right. sort of patterned after some dark oh. id in me, I think. Uh, I always wanted him to be funny and with glasses. Uh, there was a terrorist called Carlos the Jackal, and he ran around throwing hand grenades and using shotguns uh, back then. So if you look at Clarence, he's sort of a terrorist in a way. The choice to kill Murphy in the beginning was to me a really interesting one when I started to look at it as, oh, okay, I'm cr critically looking at the film from the script perspective because he, you didn't like Steve Austin him and we're just gonna fix this guy and make That's him, right. you know, you, may, you actually killed him. So this guy we sort of think is our protagonist right from the start, now he's dead. That was, I think, the most imp maybe the most important early critical uh, decision that I made. And, and it was, this was when I was still wandering around uh, thinking about it. Uh, and uh, I thought, originally I thought he was going to be a rogue. This goes back to Blade. I was working on the Blade Runner set as a volunteer because they had so many people working on it, they didn't know who was working on it. And at night, you know, on a film set, you know, you're, there's a lot of time to sit around and nothing's happening. And the environment was very, was very evocative uh, because of, of the set design. And, and the idea, I had been thinking about robot stuff a little bit. At that point, I thought he's a robot this character. The name was RoboCop, too, by the way. That was weird that that came to me so early. And then I thought, he's a cop, and he's trying to figure out how people work. It was like a machine intelligence idea about humans. But then one day, I, uh, not long after, it occurred to me that it would be much more dramatic if he was turned into a machine, and that, that it was a man that had been used. And it sort of, I just knew immediately that that was going to give you Frankenstein and everything else, and Jesus, if you wanted him. And, uh, and so that just became the way. So that identity part of it, was that all originally part of what your story was about? Or did that really come about as you No, the identity thing was, was always there. But I remember we were in production, and, and Paul turned to me and said, you know, the writers of this thing did a really smart thing. I was like, really? And he said, yeah, you're going to keep wondering how much is left, how much is left. And he was right about that. The suit you know, is an interesting... Well, that's because we got Bo Rob Botin, another genius, uh, in need of a hit. Mm -hmm. The first thing he showed us was almost what you see. And one day I said to him, you know, it's really funny. I look at Robocop and, and he's like this chest and he's like this. And I said, it really kind of looks like the, the, the front of a, like a Ram truck or something. And he said, well, Ed, it's Detroit. That's what you wrote. And so, yeah, it's a car. <laughs> and... <laughs> and it is. Yeah, well, when you talk about the kismet of all the pieces that came together and the people that were needing something and part of it and probably throwing everything they had into that project. Everybody in, in uh, RoboCop turned out to be really well. I mean, it was, I remember when Miguel Ferrer walked in the room and just went, whoa, that guy, you know, you could feel the, the room snap. And uh, I, I had to read pages with Peter Weller. Uh, and, you know, he always seemed like the right guy. He, he, he was very serious about the job. And uh, sometimes that made it difficult, but he was serious. And I appreciate that. How much did his chin really have to do with? Uh... <laughs> well, you know, it, it, one day, Rob Bottin, we, we were looking at another actor who I won't name. And, and he said, well, you know, that guy's a good actor, but he's going to look like the Michelin Man if I put him in a suit. So we really need somebody really skinny. And so that wasn't the reason we got Peter. But when, I, always thought, I always thought that we needed a serious actor in that suit. And everybody always acted like, well, you can put anybody in the suit. And it's not true, because Peter brought so much to that part, just in the physicality. The, the, the way he ended up walking is a story in itself. And it really was like a cauldron of fire, because the suit was late to the set by a lot, and we had to swap the schedule around. And so poor Peter gets in that suit the day before we shoot, 14 hours to get him in the suit, and he doesn't, and it doesn't feel right. He's trained in all these different ways, and it's just terrible. And and I think there was, and there was a kind of a mini, well, not a, there was a major crisis about this, about how how the suit would work and how he would move and stuff like that. And it and it, it was very unpleasant for everybody, for 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 both uh, Paul and for Peter and the production, but when it was resolved, you had that character. And I, it, I kind of watched the character come to life, and it didn't come to life until there was a huge amount of pressure. It was like a, it's like a diamond in a coal mine or something like that. And it was fascinating to see from a creative standpoint how well it worked and how well Peter did. 
So then you and and your writing partner, Minor and, and Verhoeven, wait a while before you get another one that you're going to do together just purely as a whole new idea, right? Well, the Starship. Oh, Starship. Well, yeah, Michael wanted to direct. So he had gone off during Robocop and directed a movie uh, that he made. And then we were suddenly very popular writers after Robocop, which, which is not as much fun as it sounds like. And uh, let's see, I... I I think I was working, I, what was I working? I was working on something at Universal and Jurassic Park came out and Phil Tippett, who had done Ed 209, was one of the guys on it. And I said to John Davis, I said, hey, let's do another movie. And I have this idea, let's do Starship Troopers. We'll get Phil Tippett to do the bugs and we'll get John, uh, we'll get uh, Paul to direct it. And I didn't even have to say that because that's, that was like, uh, he understood that. And, that, and it took seven years, but that was where it started. And uh, I wrote the script. Uh, we optioned the book and we wrote the script. And I wrote a first draft before Paul was in, even really involved. He went off and made another movie during that period. He made Showgirls. And uh, um, uh, it was probably good that Showgirls didn't do that well because I think if Showgirls had done well, he would have had many more choices. But instead, he was trapped having to do Starship Troopers. So, <laughs> so, so that's a from the start, a bigger production uh, than than what you had all worked on before. Well, Robocop was 14 and, and Starship Troopers was 125. And uh, it's really different when the money, when you put that much money on something, it makes everybody a little crazy. And yeah. it's, it's much more pressure. <clears throat> that movie also had, uh, was an early stage of tremendous amount of CGI. And if you look at that movie, that movie holds up pretty well too, the uh -huh. CGI does, and it's because it's Phil Tippett. Again, I, another, I, I think they're Bernini level artists, uh, these guys, and Phil Tippett can just do amazing things. So at the time you're, 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 engrossed in making a movie at the early stage of how you shoot CGI? Right? Well, like, he had done large. Jurassic. So Jurassic was the first where they had set a bunch of the parameters. And yeah, it was sort of the second way, second big wave of CGI. Um, and, you know, they had, they had all these, in those days, you had to do a lot more registration and a lot more like uh, documenting where the shots were and what the light was and all that kind of stuff. And they had all sorts of things. Nowadays, they don't do that as much, yeah. but they, they have it down more. But it was, it, it was, I know, I remember Paul was very worried about, okay, how am I going to get my eye lines right? You know, when somebody's looking at a bug or a whatever, a monster. And, you know, what I found about CGI was everybody, the director and everybody would get very scared about it. Uh, like, well, how are we going to do it? And what am I going to look at? And I, I said, I knew Robert Zemeckis, and I said, well, let me call up Zemeckis and see how they did, what they did, if they did anything on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And, and I call up Zemeckis, and he says, I said, I have a question for, Paul Verhoeven wants to know if you had like a, any sort of special devices or a laser or something you used to establish eye lines. And he said, no. He said, what you need is you need a stick, and you put a piece of tape on it. And then you need a good actor. And you say, that's where you're looking. And <laughs> so the propaganda aspects of both of those two um, in a big way, obviously much greater even, or it feels much greater in Starship Troopers, you know. Um, it's sort of even built into the visuals in a way, you know, the way they dress. Well, one, one Starship was meant to be, I mean, Robocop was meant to be local news in, in Detroit. And, and it was just a kind of a sort of a Greek chorus, if you want. It was a chorus, it was a counterpoint. I've always been interested in how things, what really, how things, what, what happens and how it's played. And so there's a lot of that. In Starship, it was really, I, I started with the Why We Fight series, the Capra stuff, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do war propaganda. And we ended up, I knew we would, <laughs> once Paul got involved, we would be doing Triumph of the Will. So, uh, and, and seriously, I knew he, we would do it. And if you look at the movie, it starts off as Triumph of the Will. And so that was, we, we, we kind of got, you know, we got along on that. I was doing uh, Frank Capra and he was doing, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, yeah. the Lenny, Lenny Riefenstahl, Riefenstahl, yeah. So that part of it though, in your satire, you know, when you're, I think it's, I just think uh, that both scripts have a tone that, uh, great consistency all the way through, but sometimes it's, it's hard, right? It's like, who's going to, how are people going to respond to that tone? Are they going to cap, catch well, you, you, that you, it's... You don't, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, I, I would say the interesting thing about Paul and I is is we've, we've had two movies together, and there's really not that tone. You don't see that tone anywhere else. How much um, did knowing you now had those resources affect the way you were writing? Well, I think I thought... 
that if I could write a movie that got made, and if it was good, and my God, if it was a hit, then I would know what I was doing. In some ways, Robocop was, for me, a, the way I, I think it was, a, the way I taught myself to write, to, to, to be a screenwriter. And if you look at the act structure, it really has first act, second act, third act, with little bumpers in between them. And that was me trying to understand st story structure. And so, you know, those were the things I was worried about. Like, how do I write this? And yes, what does character mean? I don't know, you know. Uh, what is structure? I have no idea. Uh, one day somebody, t I said, I don't know what structure is to somebody. And they said, oh, Billy Wilder says it's simple. It's one, two, three. Problem, <laughs> complication, resolution. That was a really important thing for me to think about because I started thinking about one, two, three a lot. And then I, the, all, if you look at Robocop, it's all one, two, threes. It's all setups complications and payoffs or setups and payoffs all through and it's like a little numerical thing and I'm, I'm not a math guy but when Paul Verhoeven showed up who has a PhD in math he was like oh wow this is like this is like a Mondrian painting it's like mathematical you know so anyway that's how that came to be but, but then there were a lot of really nice moments in there that don't feel um, like they're just mathematical like when he goes back to uh, his house, you know. That's the Paradise Lost sequence. Yeah. And that was also what Paul, Paul was, yeah, again, classical education, he was, oh, it's Paradise Lost. So those things we knew were, were in there and they're kind of built in. Once you have that idea that he dies, you, all of those things kind of are available to you. That's like, as you're moving forward with your own property and developing it for a life, you know, how how are you looking at it between one and two? Like, what is it that you wanted to do after you finished one? What were you thinking you still needed to say? Uh, I've always been interested in. I think it's old, It's really about how society orders itself. But I, I I've always been interested in cops and the military. Uh, I spent time as a kid. I lived in a in a township where it was all school teachers and cops. So my neighbors were cops. I, I went on ride-alongs with them when I was a kid. And then later when I was doing Starship, because of and because of RoboCop now, I've met a lot of cops. And uh, and I was always I was always very worried that cops would not like RoboCop, but in fact they love it. Um, uh, their favorite one, their favorite scene was the reading the Miranda rights as they <laughs> threw the suspect through the <laughs> through the windows. Uh, uh, then I read a book by uh, Colonel David. Hackworth, who was Army, and that was very influential for Starship. Um, and, you know, you just, I guess I kind of, I didn't know anything much about the military bef as I started to write the script, but you sort of accrue a little bit. And I was very pleased that the military accepted the movie. And I think, honestly, we want to be protected. We think, what is the cost of being uh, a soldier? What is the cost of being uh, a cop? And what are the benefits to society? And we can't live without them. And so I think there's a fascination with that whole thing. When you decided you wanted to do that, to actually adapt it, it was, had you gone back to look at it and the, before, was it more out of the, what was the- It was the more out of in my mind, what it, what, what it could, sort of a memory of that, more the attitude in anything. And I was a little bit interested in the kind of the melodrama of, of a triangle, uh -huh. you know, and a relationship triangle. I read it when I was 13. It was the greatest book I ever read. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and everybody knew it. When I started thinking about doing it as a movie, I thought, oh, we'll never get that book. It's, it's been optioned. And so I was kind of operating, I was writing the story without it a little bit, uh, a military story set in the future, and there are bugs and stuff, but it wasn't really the book. Then we were able to get the book and it was a little bit shocking, like, oh my God, I'm writing, I'm gonna adapt Starship Troopers. And um, I would go around while I was writing it and I would be in a bar somewhere and I would say, well, I'm writing Starship Troopers. And the guy, inevitably, the bartender would say, that, that's the reason I went into the military, that book. Or, you know, it was a very important book to people. When I was 35, it was not much of a story anymore. It was kind of an attitude with some ideas in it and, and it wasn't a movie. It was a fine book, but it wasn't a movie and I knew I was gonna change some stuff. And so in that case, I, it, it was good for me in writing the movie to literally put the book aside. And I, I, I would refer to it if I, you know, Ratchik has some lines that are in the book, you know, come on you apes, you want to live forever, things like that. So I, I wanted to preserve those things, but everything else was not, it wasn't helpful to have the book there. You've been watching a conversation with Edward Newmeyer on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project. 
that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. 